Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Brian Shapiro, a scientific content specialist at ATCC. Thank you for joining us for the latest installment in the ATCC Excellence in Research webinar series entitled On the Edge of the Bubble, Use of Exosomes as Reference Materials in Biomedical Research, presented by Dr. Siddhartha Paul. Dr. Paul is a scientist at ATCC. In this presentation, Dr. Paul will provide an overview of exosomes from various well-characterized ATCC cell lines. He will then show data indicating that these extracellular vesicles can be used as reference materials in biological research and assay development. If you have any questions for our speaker, please use the chat function available through the webinar program. All questions will be answered as time allows at the end of the presentation. The recorded webinar presentation will be archived on the ATCC website, www.atcc.org. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Sid Paul. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro, for the introduction. I'd like, also like to thank everyone who joined our, our webinar. In today's presentation, I will discuss about exosomes, a fairly new field of research with a huge potential in different research aspects. I will also discuss about ATCC's effort in developing exosome reference materials that would be useful for researchers in this field. First, a little background on ATCC. ATCC is a nonprofit organization founded in 1925 with headquarters in Manassas, Virginia, and an R&D and service center in Gaithersburg, Maryland. It is the world's largest and the most diverse biological materials and information resources for microbes. In Gaithersburg, we are an innovative R&D company featuring cell biology, gene editing, advanced models, cell line derivatives such as exosome, which is what today's web webinar will focus on. This brings us to the agenda of the talk. Today's presentation is broken up into three parts. In the first part, I'll briefly talk about what are exosomes and current state of exosome research and the need for exosome reference materials in research. Then I'll give you an overview of ADCC's exosome isolation strategy, quality and reproducibility. Then I will show you both characterization and data and functional data supporting ADCC exosomes. So this brings us to the first part of the talk, exosome and extracellular vesicles. Extracellular vesicles are lipid bilayer that are secreted from cells. Their size ranges from 10 nanometer up to two micrometer. One of the subclasses of extracellular vesicles are exosomes, which are between the size of 30 nanometer to 150 nanometer. Exosomes are produced by the endocytic pathway in the endosomal compartment of most of the eukaryotic cells and are released outside as seen on the figure on the right. Also seen on the figure on the right, Exosomes are further divided into large exosomes of the size 90 to 120 nanometer, small exosomes which are of the size 60 to 80 nanometer, and exomeres which are below 35 nanometer in size. Exosomes are known to carry proteins and nucleic acid as cargo in them for intercellular communication. Due to this, in recent years, there has been a huge surge in this field amongst a very broad range of researchers. With the increase in this field, exosomes are seen as a major tool for three potential applications, both in clinical and preclinical research. The first field that exosomes may have a huge impact is diagnostics. Exosomes are innovative targets as they are present in diverse body fluids. They are currently tested for diagnostic markers in different diseases, especially cancer. The second field where exosomes are tested is cell therapy or regenerative medicine. A number of different reports have been published to demonstrate 
therapeutic effects of exosomes from mesenchymal stem cells in different diseases such as cardiovascular, liver, and neuronal diseases. The third field of application exosome is currently exploring is drug delivery system. Multiple research, research reports have shown that exosomes can be loaded with small molecules or microRNA and delivered into the tissues. This is extremely important if, for example, brain is a target tissue because it is believed that the blood-brain barrier represents an impediment to the drug delivery of the, to the central nervous system and exosomes can cross this barrier. So this brings us to a good topic of exosomes as a reference standard. So in the field of science, it is very important to have reference standards or reference material. Reference standards reduces time and cost during developmental work. This is extremely important for a lab that is trying to venture into a new field of research and having a well-characterized reference material will be very helpful. Reference standards increases the reproducibility of the assays. This is again very true, especially in standardizing a specific assay or an instrument in the lab. Reference material also help in regulating quality of one's own material. It has been known that consistent use of controls in your experiment make the data more believable. Thereby, having reference standards would add value to the research work or the product development in a company. Lastly, I would like to emphasize that any material that ATCC generates is of highest quality with extensive characterization and authentication from parental to derivative. So this brings us to the second part of the talk. In this part, I would like to give an overview of ATCC's exosome isolation strategy and quality control that is performed on purified exosomes reference materials. This slide shows the ATCC's exosome isolation strategy from cell culture medium. To begin exosome isolation, we always use well-characterized and authenticated ATCC cell lines. We have developed a novel tangential flow filtration based exosome isolation strategy. Briefly, as seen on the right figure, large volumes of conditioned media are collected from the cells. The medium is then centrifuged to remove dead cells of debris, which is the pre-cleaning step. The clarified medium is then filtered, washed, and concentrated using TFF. The retained fraction contains purified exosomes which are used for downstream exosome characterization and analysis. Our isolation strategy have been able to eliminate most of the serum albumin contaminate in the purified material. Also, this isolation strategy is also very gentle on the vesicles compared to most of the other isolation strategies. Once we have purified and wild exosomes, each exosome undergoes a rigorous QC analysis before the lot is released. Because of the lack of well-characterized exosome reference material currently in the market, we believe ATCC's exosome reference material can be used for assay development, including biomarker studies or exosome size standard or controls for lab developed tests. This slide shows the ATCC's exosome portfolio. ATCC is currently working on one HTAT immortalized mesenchymal stem cell line, eight continuous cancer cell line representing different cancer types. We decided to use HTAT MSCs instead of primary MSCs because primary MSCs have donor to donor variability and a limited lifespan. But HTAT MSCs are from a single source and are continuous. This would in turn reduce lot to lot variability. Similarly, continuous cancer cell lines would also reduce lot to lot variability of the exosome cargo content. Thereby, exosome from these cells would be a good reference material. Currently, the exosomes from HTAT MSCs and exosomes from A549 are already available for purchase and the rest are coming soon. This slide shows 
all the QC tests that we have performed on each lot of exosomes, and this is repeated on our certificate of analysis. We first evaluate protein equivalent concentration of exosomes. We use standard BCA assay for this. We then evaluate the particle concentration of exosome through nano tracking analysis and report exact number of particles that is represented in the vial. We also evaluate size distribution and report percent particle within 50 to 200 nanometer. We also evaluate multiple exosomal protein markers, both transmembrane and cytosolotic, through Western blotting. We also perform sterility and mycoplasma tests on our exosomes. Once our exosomes have fulfilled all the above QC criteria, we re release the lot for sale. This table shows a comparison of ATCC exosomes with competitor exosomes. This table emphasizes what we define in each vial of our exosome. As seen from the table, competitor H, A, B, and Z do not define exact size range. Also, competitor H, A, B, and Z do not define number of particles per vial. Again, competitor A, B, and Z do not perform the marker verification for each lot. Lastly, competitor H do not provide any functional data of their exosomes. All these attributes separates ATCC exosomes from the current competitors. This brings us to the next section of my talk, characterization and validation of ATCC exosomes. In this part, I will show you how we characterize the exosomes and assess their functionality in different assays. So once we have purified the exosome through our strategy, we looked at the size distribution profile and also measured the particle concentration. This was done by through NT analysis. Here you can see a side by side comparison of two lots of MSC exosome purified through our strategy. As seen from the two plots, we were able to get a consistent population of exosomes between different runs. Also, more than 90% of our particles fell within the range of exosomes, which is 50 to 200 nanometer. Also, we were able to achieve high particles numbers through our isolation strategy. Both the figure and the table show the robustness and repro reproducibility of our isolation strategy. We then looked at the quality of our exosomes through their ability to express exosomal protein markers. This is again a side-by-side -side comparison of two lots of MSC exosomes purified through our strategy. In both the figures, lane one represents unpurified condition media before TFF. As expected, they were too diluted to have any exosomal protein marker. Lane two represents purified exosomes through TFF. And they expressed all the exosome protein markers, including the tetrasmenins. Lane three represents flow through of the filter after the filter was rinsed post exosome isolation to observe if there is any loss of exosome in the filter itself. As seen, there is no loss of exosome in the filter during purification. Both this figure reiterates the robustness and reproducibility of our isolation strategy. We wanted to see if our purified exosomes were be able to be taken up by the recipient cell lines. We performed this uptake assay on a multiple different cell types including cancer and astrocytes. In this figure, A549 exosomes were labeled with RNA binding dye, which is green in fluorescence, and added to the recipient A549 cells. After four hours of incubation, cells were then fixed and stained with DAPI. Images were captured with a fluorescent microscope. Image A depicts dye labeled exosomes added to the cells. Image B shows only dye added to the cells. And image C shows cells without any dye or labeled exosome. As seen from figure A, exosomes were successfully taken up by the cells and they accumulate in the cytoplasm. This figure again suggests that ATCC exosomes are intact and are easily taken up by the cells. 
After we thoroughly characterized our exosomes, we decided to see if our exosomes are functional in functional studies. In this part, I will show you some data from in vitro functional assays. One of the first validation assay we performed on our exosomes was scratch assay. We cultured primary gingival keratinocytes in cell culture plates. Then we scratched to create a gap in the culture. We then treated the cells with 100 microgram per mil protein equivalent concentration of exosomes from different cell types. Images were acquired over time under a phase contrast microscope. Images were then analyzed and the gap width was used to measure the gap and generate the graph. As seen from the figures, both MSC and IPSC exosomes promoted cell migration and gap closure compared to untreated cells. These data suggest that ATCC exosomes are functional in in vitro assays. We went ahead and performed another in vitro functional assay with the stem cell exosomes. Here we evaluated the effect of ATCC exosome on tubular formation in an in vitro angiogenesis assay. ATCC angioregi angiogenesis system was used for this study. GFP labeled endothelial cells were treated with 100 microgram per mil protein equivalent concentration of exosomes from different cell types. Untreated cells received no exosomes and for positive controls, cells were supplemented with five nanogram per mil VGF to promote angiogenesis. The treatment was continued for seven days. After seven days, the cells were imaged under a fluorescent microscope to observe tubular formation. The tubular lens were also measured and a graph was generated. As seen from figure A, both MSC and IPSC exosomes promoted angiogenesis. Also, figure B shows that the average length of the tubules under different treatments. As compared to the untreated control, both IPSC and MSC exosomes show the significant tubule formation. This study demonstrate that ATCC stem cell exosomes are functional in nature. We also wanted to evaluate if the tumor exosomes isolated through our strategy were functional. To do this, we used one of the classical tumor genesis assay, soft agar assay. In this slide, the protocol of the assay is shown. In this assay, primary human lung fibroblast cells were treated for seven days with 100 microgram per mil protein equivalent concentration of exosomes from different cancer lines. After seven days of treatment, cells were harvested and seeded into plates containing soft agar. The plates were then incubated for 21 days for the appearance of colonies. The colonies were then stained with crystal violet. The stained colonies were then counted for each treatment and a graph was gen generated. As seen from figure A, cancer exosomes were able to transform lung fibroblast cells and hence colonies appeared compared to normal exosomes from lung fibroblast fail to induce any colonies. Also, figure B shows the transformation of the fibroblast cells by cancer exosomes was very significant compared to normal exosomes. Taken together all the functional data, I would like to suggest that exosomes purified through our strategy not only fulfill the minimal information for the studies of extracellular vesicles, also known as MySAF guidelines, but are also functional in nature. This brings us to the conclusion. Finally, to conclude, firstly, ATCC exosomes are derived from well-characterized and authenticated ATCC cell line. I would like to emphasize that ATCC exosomes meets the same QC standards as ATCC cell line. Secondly, ATCC exosomes demonstrate expected size distribution and expression of characteristic protein markers. I'd like to say that they meet the criteria set by MICEP guidelines. Thirdly, the exosomes demonstrated functionality in multiple different in vitro assays. This means that our exosomes remain intact and are functional during storage. 
Fourthly, ATCC exosome isolation strategies ensures high purity, high reproducibility with lot to lot, low lot to lot variability. During our standardization of this strategy, we have tried to streamline the whole process of isolation to ensure this exosome can be used for a longer period of time. Lastly, I would like to say that ATTC offers custom exosome isolation services and solutions. We would be more than happy to collaborate in this frontier. For further information, please visit www.attc.org slash exosomes. Thank you very much for your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, well, thank you, Sid. In just a few moments, we will begin our Q&A session. Please use the chat function available through the webinar program to submit your questions. The recorded webinar presentation will be available on demand on the ATCC website at www.atcc.org. Okay, and we were just joined by ATCC product line business specialist Steve Budd and lead biologist Heather Branscombe. They'll be helping uh, us answer your questions. Uh, our first question has just come in. Um, this one looks like a good one for Steve. So how are ATCC exosomes packaged and stored? Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, that is a good question. So each vial of exosomes that we offer are frozen in about 100 to 200 microliters of DPP, uh, DPBS, uh, and they can be stored at minus 20 degrees Celsius. So the good thing about this is, I guess, so it's just stored in PBS. There's no added preservatives or anything like that. So there's no harsh chemicals that you're going to be pipetting in your assay. Um, so a couple comments about storage I like to hit on is, so each vial that you get is going to, we, we guarantee a minimum of 1 billion exosomes per vial and the exact amount is noted on, on, the, on the C of A. So if you think about it, whenever you pipette something, um, you know exactly how many exosomes you're doing in each assay. So that's, a, that's sort of a convenient benefit. Um, and it's also, you, that's gonna also amount to about a, roughly 100, microgram, or 100 micrograms of protein. Um, uh, and again, with packaging, you can't, when you receive them, they can be uh, multiple freeze thralls or, or as most things are, are, you should try to avoid that. So when you receive it, you can, you can aliquot them into whatever your, your desired amount. Also, I'd like to add to that, that all the functional studies that we have done are the frozen exosomes, not freshly made exosomes. So we, we basically the customer, whatever we sell to the customer, we do the same thing for our functional studies. That's a good point. All right, great, great. Uh, so this next one looks like a good one for Heather. Uh, what method is used for isolation and how does it compare to other methods of exosome isolation? All right, thank you for the question and hi everybody, thanks for attending. So for our method of exosome isolation, we're using a tangential flow filtration, which is an advanced filtration method that Sid discussed in the webinar. And while there's several methods that are routinely used for exosome isolation, this particular method is good for us because it allows us to uh, process large batches of material, several liters, in a relatively short time frame compared to a method such as uh, ultracentrifugation. And additionally, it's relatively gentle, and there's a lot of built-in process controls that allow us to monitor the isolation pr procedure, such as um, allowing us to see the transmembrane pressure, the shear, and monitoring the feed flow, just to make sure that we can have control over the process. Okay, good, good. Uh, so here's one that Sid could probably address. Um, is anything done to the cells to induce more exosome production? Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, our main aim was to make exosome reference material. Yes, there are drugs which can induce uh, some cells to produce some exosomes. Uh, however, we did not do any of such treatments. We wanted the cells to produce the exosome in the natural way so that we have the natural cargo in the exosomes uh, so that the people can study those cargo and there's no changes 
due to uh, any effects of any drug to induce the exosome production. So uh, we have not done to induce or stimulate any exo extra exosome, exosome production from the cells. Cells are generally grown in the normal basal condition as you grow your cell culture media, cell culture cells. Okay, great. Thanks, Sid. So um, maybe this next question would be a good one for both Sid and Heather to hit on. Um, has the biological cargo of the ATCC exosomes been characterized? Uh, yes. Uh, so we have tried to follow most of the MySafe uh, the guidelines uh, set by ICE, uh, International Society for Extracellular Vesicles. Uh, we have in incorporated most of this in our QC of the uh, of the exosome that we isolate from cell lines. Uh, that includes looking at the size distribution, uh, looking at the particle concentration through uh, nanocyte, which is the most accepted uh, methods of looking at the exosome quality. Uh, we also looked at uh, multiple different uh, exosomal protein markers, uh, both transmembrane and cytosolic exosome uh, proteins uh, during our QC. Okay, um, Heather, would you like to add to that? Sure, I can expand a little bit on the specific cargo. So we do have preliminary data where we've done proteomic analysis and RNA sequencing, and I'll see if maybe we can share some of that information as application data, but we can confirm that we can isolate or recover roughly 100 nanograms per microliter of RNA from our exosomes. And we also have done, as I said, proteomics where we've identified protein-protein interactions that are unique between uh, cancer exosomes as well as stem cell exosomes. And we see unique differences among the proteomic profiles of exosomes derived from different sources of cells. Okay. Uh, now, here's another one that uh, either Sid or Heather can take, uh, or both. Uh, are there any specific biomarkers used to characterize the exosomes? Uh, so we have characterized and verified all our exosomes using the known uh, transmembrane markers, uh, including CD81, CD9, CD63, and also other markers such as such as Alex, uh, TSG1, and Flotilin. Uh, we use these markers for our each every lot characterization. Uh, other than that, we are currently looking at other cancer markers which might be present. Like we are also looking at some of the PDL1 markers that might be present in most of the uh, uh, cancer exosomes. Uh, yes, uh, so that would be my answer. Okay, great. Um, uh, now here's a really good question that uh, that I actually never would have thought of. Um, how do you know there aren't any apoptotic bodies in the exosome preps? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, so the, the filters that we use during our tangential flow filtration process uh, actually eliminates anything bigger than 300 nanometer. Apoptotic bodies are known to be bigger than 500 nanometer up to two micrometer or above. Uh, so we try to control our process pretty good. So we don't see those peaks coming up in our uh, nanocyte analysis. So we are pretty confident that the, the population that we are uh, isolating through, uh, through our process is mostly exosome within the size range of 50 to 200 nanometer. There might be few particles, but they have not gone beyond 400 nanometer. I can elaborate a little bit on that just um, with respect to the manufacturing processes that we use when we're scaling up the cells prior to exosome isolation and we ensure that the cells are always in optimal growth and that they're healthy which would I think reduce the possibility or probability that there would be a large percentage of apoptotic bodies that would, would even be present in the, the bulk media before we even prepare it for TFF. Okay, good, good. Um, We've got a few more questions in. Uh, the the first one we we may have already answered somewhat, but but uh, just in case we missed anything, um, are the exosomes used freshly isolated or after freezing in the functional assays 
And then do they uh, retain activity after freeze thaw? Yes, so I think I have covered that in the first question, but I would like to say again that uh, we have used both fresh exosomes, and but mostly for all our assays that I've shown in this webinar are the frozen exosomes. Uh, we have done multiple freeze thaws and we have seen our exosome have been functional in multiple functional assays. Uh, so yeah, so I think that's 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 about it. <laughs> okay, great, great. Um, here here's a good question. Also, um, are the cell lines grown in FBS? So like when you're doing uh, exosome harvesting, um, this are the cells grown in FBS? Okay, sure. That's a good question and really important to address when you're speaking about exosomes because you don't want to have potential contamination of fetal bovine or um, uh, bovine exosomes. So we make sure that prior to our collection of media before TFF that we remove the serum containing exosomes and we wash the cells thoroughly with PBS and then we introduce a serum that has been depleted of exosomes. Again, just to reduce the possibility of having contamination from vesicles from another source. Okay, good, good. Um, now, how did you lice the isolated exosomes to identify the cargo? So, uh, so we use a normal protein lysis buffer, something like REPA buffer. We also add protease inhibitor to it, uh, and then we sometimes do sonication to petalize the cargo and we generally have treated our exosomes mostly like a normal protein lysis from a cell. Okay, so you know, a typical Western blot protocol then, Correct. right? Yeah. Okay, good, good. Um, and uh, here, here's a good question. Uh, what is the timeline for availability of additional cell line exosomes? Looking into your crystal ball, Steve. Sure, because it's always accurate. Um, <laughs> yeah, so currently we have exosomes from um, the, the, the h 3 MSCs and the A549s that's available now. We plan on launching the, the other, um, the additional ones between now and roughly July of next year. So they'll be coming out sort of every other month or every month kind of a thing, one or two at a time. So they'll be, they'll be gradually launched between now and um, roughly July of next, of next year. Okay, well, at this time, we will conclude our Q&A sessions. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists for the excellent presentation, and thank you, everyone, for attending the webinar. Uh, please join us for more webinars in the ATCC Excellence in Research webinar series. On November 14th, Andrew Frank will present his talk on ATCC's new genome portal. Uh, thank you again, everyone and have a great day.